Hello and welcome to this International Green Gown Awards Masterclass. Um, and we are uh, very pleased to share with you um, some information about the International Green Gown Awards. And um, or we will also be hearing from our partners, uh, some of our partners for, from the International Green Gown Awards family. And we'll also be hearing from two 2001 um, International Green Gown Award winners um, a bit later on. And there'll be plenty of time for questions uh, later on towards that. So a quick overview of our agenda. Um, I'm Fiona Goodwin. I'm the Secretariat for the International Green Gown Awards, and I'm from the EAUC, which is the Alliance for Sustainability Leadership in Education. So I will give a quick overview of the International Green Gown Awards. We will then hear from Hillage, from the, who's the Secretary General from the International Association of Universities. Then we shall hear from Richard Grubb, the Head of Commonwealth, UN and Strategic Partnerships from the Association of Commonwealth Universities. We will then hear from Dr. Folashe Day um, from Covenant University Nigeria, who was a 2021 winner for the Next Generation Learning and Skills category. Then we will hear from Professor Philip Morgan from the University of Newcastle in Australia, and he was, they were the 2021 Highly Commended Benefiting Society and the Student Engagement category. So firstly, I'd just like to say thank you to all of our supporters. The International Green Gown Awards is in association with Alliance Global Investors. It is supported by the UN Environment Programme, by IAU, by AUF and the ACU as well. So why do you want to enter the International Green Gown Awards? It brings brilliant rewards for you, for all across your institution, for your student engagement, your staff engagement, and really sharing your story and really gaining senior management support and recognition for all the hard work that you've been doing. As I've said, that we, the International Green Gown Awards are recognised by the UN Environment Programme, so they have a global recognition, recognition and they are the only leading um, sustainability awards at a global level. We have an annual awards ceremony, and this takes place alongside the United Nations High Level Political Forum. So again, this brings really high level profile for your institution. So for 2022, um, we have six categories. We have a new category called 2030 Climate Action, this is really focusing on, on institutions' net zero targets and particularly endorsing and recognising those that are signatories of the race to zero for universities and colleges. We also have benefiting society, creating impact, next generation learning and skills, student engagement and the coveted sustainability institution of the year. So I've now covered some top tips for you to help you with your application. So first of all, you need to prepare yourself by reading the guidance notes. All of the information is available on our website and there's lots of help and advice on there for you. But please don't be afraid to ask for help and you can seek out mentors within your own institution, um, within different teams and um, also with previous winners and highly commended. You can also get inspired, inspiration from our previous winners. Um, and they're all available again on our website and there's a whole host of case studies and videos. So you can see what a winning application really looks like. So you need to really make sure you submit the best application you can. And you need to make sure you provide plenty of evidence of the impact that your project or your initiative has had. Also, don't leave your submission to the last minute. Start planning your application. Uh, consider what category um, you would want to apply for. Uh, you need to, you can only apply for one category per project or initiative, but you can apply for multiple categories for different projects and different initiatives. You need to find um, the correct people in your teams to request the data that you can get but also involve your students, ask them to help and delegate some tasks to them. It's a really great engagement opportunity for you. And set clear objectives from the outset in terms of what you're wanting to achieve. 
So it's imperative that you really prepare well for your application. You need to read the entry criteria for each category. They all have slightly different requirements within them. So you need to really make your, sure your application is very specific to the category criteria that you are applying for. And if you're unsure which category to um, apply for, do get in touch with us and we can help advise you. If you think your submission doesn't fit in the category, then it probably doesn't. So do really look at the category criteria and make sure you um, address the criteria within your application. We have a judging panel made up from experts um, from the sector, um, from around the world that make up our judging panel. So you need to consider who will be reading your entry. Imagine if you're one of the judges, what would you want to see? What would you like to, see, like to read? And what would you need to see on how to make a winning application? We will receive many applications and so really make sure your application is clear and succinct. And make sure your title of your application is catchy and memorable. The judging is based on a composite view of the application taking account of the criteria within the application form and as well the specific category criteria. Also keep it simple. Don't fill your submission with contents of existing sales or marketing materials. Instead, ensure you answer the questions being asked. Make sure your answers are clear and easy to understand. And use headings or subheadings to structure your submission. Please don't provide any web links as the judges would not have time to review these. Instead, ensure that you have all the information in the application itself. And most importantly, you have to stick to the page limit. Uh, you, they will not be accepted if they're above the page limit. So you need to ensure that you've got some real facts and figures to substantiate your application. This is an accurate representation of your achievements. And this is making sure that you can show the impact of your project. And that might be to the impact with students, with staff, the wider community. So please do provide date before and after data if possible. So what to do next? Please visit our website, read up on all the guidance notes, um, get inspiration from our past winners, read the category and the criteria to find out which would be most suitable for your application, read the requirements of the application form, engage with your students and your staff, start collecting your data and your evidence, and also don't leave it too late, allow plenty of time. The application deadline is on the 31st of March. And we're here to help. So whilst all full guidance is available on our website, you can also choose your language on the website um, to your native language, but please note that all applications must be submitted by, in English. If you still need any further advice or guidance, then please do just get in touch with us. So make this year, this year your year to enter. And thanks again to all of our supporters. I will now hand you over to Hillage um, from IAU. Thank you, Fiona. This is an um, excellent presentation of what is uh, awaiting people who would wish to uh, take part in uh, and to submit a proposal for the Global Green Gown Awards. The IAU is very pleased to be a supporter of the project together with the Association of Commonwealth Universities and the Association of uh, Universities in the Francophonie, uh, and now newly as well with UNEP. That's a very nice uh, new development as well of the Green Gown Awards, uh, because it is um, a unique award, as you said before, an award that merits uh, all the attention of universities wishing to step up their action when it comes to engaging with higher education for sustainable development or engaging with Agenda 2030 for that matter and the sustainable development goals. Higher education and research for sustainable development has gained momentum uh, quite significantly over the pandemic. Uh, we see that the world is facing challenges that are certainly not unique to the places where we live, but they are global in nature. 
and universities have a key role to play to address the challenges that we face. And thus, um, they do work uh, a lot when it comes to sustainability, sustainable development. They offer support in many forms and shapes um, at all the levels of the institution, in education, in research, in community engagement. And so it is important that that is made even more visible um, in, in a tangible way. And these awards are an opportunity to do so not only for the team working on a certain project, but also then for the institution to better understand what is happening, to possibly scale up activities and action at the whole of institution level, to also showcase what the university is doing in particular in a country, and then to also share that information with peers in a country, on a continent, and at the global level. So we're very pleased again with our partners to be supporting this important uh, Green Gown Award. Why the IAU? Just very briefly, the International Association of Universities has been um, working uh, on sustainable development um, in its more environmental understanding from the start uh, when the Brundtland report was launched in 19, back in the early 90s. And since then, the successive IU boards have reaffirmed the commitment of the association uh, to foster sustainable development at all the levels within higher education institutions. So we've developed all kinds of activities along the way. We've drafted statements, uh, engagement op offered engagement opportunities for universities to engage more strongly either as clusters, subgroups um, at uh, national, international or global level. And we've um, stepped up our activities in action when the uh, Agenda 2030 was adopted. Then we developed a global cluster on higher education and research for sustainable development. And today we count more than 100 universities from around the world working on the SDGs separately and across the whole spectrum of the SDGs. We've also developed a whole series of publications and we will be very pleased this year again to take part in the Green Down Awards to also help maybe universities develop in the future to showcase what they do, to make that visible on the IAU Global Portal on Higher Education and Research for Sustainable Development to connect universities one with another and to, again, together with ACU, AUF, EAUC, and UNEP, um, to really look at how we can um, improve the engagement of universities with uh, this very broad agenda, sustainable development, uh, how to translate that in very different forms and, and shapes in the, at the level of the higher education institutions, and certainly also to advocate for everything that is being done at the global level and uh, also to showcase it to, for instance, policymakers. And so we're very pleased to also every year see that the launch of, um, of the awardees and the, and the awards itself is being done at the uh, New York High Level Poli Political Forum in July because it's an extra opportunity for universities to be um, uh, very visible and also to really showcase in a very prominent and interesting new way how universities engage so that um, governments cannot um, ignore the huge importance of the work of higher education when it comes to addressing the sustainable development goals. I'll leave it at this and hope that there will be a little bit of a conversation towards the end. I look forward to hearing from Phil and from Adek Boyer on how this translates uh, both in Australia and in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ilij. And we fully um, welcome the support from IAU and for such a long time, long-term partnership for us. Okay, um, we would now like to introduce Richard um, from ACU. Thank you, and uh, thanks Silage for, for that introduction as well. Um, I haven't got too much to add. Um, I think uh, to, to begin with, um, I can just give you a very brief introduction to the ACU. The ACU is a membership organisation of more than 500 universities spread out throughout the Commonwealth. And our members' institutions reflect the full diversity of the Commonwealth, with members based in all five continents of the world. 
with just over two thirds of our members based in low and middle income countries and several based in low in small island states, um, many find themselves in the front lines of the impacts of climate change. So this demonstrates the need for the acceleration of sustainable solutions and practices. At the ACU, we recognize that universities are key to mitigating the negative impacts of climate change. And we strive to support our members to develop and implement these solutions and practices and encourage sustainability. We're immensely proud of the work that our members do, and it's been a pleasure to see this work rightly recognized at the Green Gown Awards. The number of applications that we receive at the awards increases year on year, and the title of an award winner is highly coveted by our members. The innovative way in which previous award winners have worked has inspired universities across the Commonwealth to build on these successes and implement their own innovative sustainability practices. This is something that we've seen recognized through our, our own SDG network, which brings together staff and students from across our network of universities who are directly engaging with the SDGs. While we've been proud uh, to see our members recognized previously, we know that there is incredible work going unrecognized and we encourage all of our members across the globe to submit your entries for this year's awards. As Hillage has, has briefly mentioned already, the ACU is working in collaboration with the IAU and the AUF to promote, to promote at the highest levels the contribution of the universities towards the SDGs, including through our status as an accredited member uh, organization at HLPF, where this year's awards will be um, announced. The, the partnership that we have with the AUF and the IAU allows us to speak on behalf of more than 2,000 universities and use the types of examples of sustainability best practice on show at the Green Gown Awards to demonstrate that without universities, achievement of the sustainable development goals will, not be, will be impossible. So it's therefore vital that these awards are used as a forum for sharing ideas across the world and as a means of inspiring others to take action. The ACU is proud to once again be supporting these awards in partnership with, uh, with those on the call today, and we're excited to review the applications as they come in. Uh, I'd like to pass on the, uh, on behalf of the ACU thanks to the EAUC for all of their work in, in organising these awards um, and allowing us to support such a brilliant, brilliant initiative. Uh, and we wish all the applicants and nominees the best of luck for this year's awards. Many thanks. Thank you, Richard. And we really um, do um, appreciate the um, support that ACU and all your membership provide to the Special Green Gown Awards. Right, uh, so now we're going to hear from some of our um, previous winners to find out what it meant to them on what winning an International Green Gown Award. Uh, first off, we will hear from Dr. Adebori Falashide of Covenant University in Nigeria. Thank you so much for this um, opportunity. Um, yes, I'm speaking from Nigeria, that's Africa. And um, we are so delighted to be part of what is going on around the world. Well, for Covenant University, um, um, we participated for the first time, that was in 2021, that was last year. So that was the first time we took part and um, it was so encouraging that we didn't only participate, we were also able to win the award. Um, they, I want to talk just briefly on um, RCE, um, that is housed in Covenant University. RCE is um, Regional Center of Expertise and um, um, we are one of the 177 RCE centers um, around the world. Um, RC Ogun is um, domiciled in Covenant University and um, Covenant University is um, a growing and dynamic birthed and um, vision driven university. And when we had the opportunity to be able to participate in climate change action, we, we plugged so fully into it. And I'll just tell you one of the few things that we did and how it has impacted on our environment. Um, for um, the RCE, 
what we did is basically we had um, projects that were in two phases. And um, the first phase of the project was basically to create awareness around um, our environment, okay? Um, o o Ota is where Covenant University is located. And um, that's one of the states in Nigeria. And um, we basically focused on the secondary school students. Um, and basically because their age, they could understand, they could, they were active, they could participate. And of course they had so much ideas on what um, action changes they could come up with. And then um, we looked towards, um, we, uh, we, we discovered that um, climate change is um, actions as good as they were, were not things that we could include in um, the regular curriculum in schools as much as we tried to do that. So we, when we discovered we couldn't do that, we, um, we hinged on extracurricular activities. And by so doing, we were able to sensitize the students who by extension sensitize their environment, sensitize their parents, sensitize their environment. Everybody living around us now understand everybody has a part to play in improving um, 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 this, they, 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 the, the beauty of our environment. And that's, everybody has a part to play. And so these children were able to do that. And um, in doing that, they came up with different kinds of projects. And basically um, the main pollution in our own environment were basically plastic, uh, which is produced so much in high quantity. And what um, did they do many of these things, were able to pull them together. And by so doing, they were able to create many things like ornaments, like um, water fountains, like um, different kinds of concepts that reduced um, plastic pollution. And we had outputs that improve knowledge, improve sustainability, and very importantly, inclusiveness, because the children went around not only in the environments where they lived, but also in their school environment to create so much of awareness. And so um, because we were opportune to be part of um, the 2021 Green, Ground, um, Green Gown Awards, um, we intend to increase inclusiveness this year because it has imparted so much. The award brought so much beauty and color and it made everybody around us to understand that everyone has a part to play and what you do goes a long way to, to also make our world a better place to live in. And so in this year, what we intend to do is to increase our drive, increase our scope. We were, we've been able to look at those in the secondary level of education. We want to look at even those that are younger because we believe that um, when we catch them much younger, and um, we are able to continue um, sustainably, um, we will have a wider reach at the end of the day. We want to increase more inclusiveness, like we said, and then hoping that we'll be able to come up with better projects this year, um, and of course, um, perform better than we did last year. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's such an inspiration to hear from all of your excellent work that you're doing in Nigeria. And I love the uh, bringing the beauty and the color to, to the awards um, as well. Um, and we will be hearing more from you in our Q&A later. Um, so thank you very much. Um, thank you. I would now like to introduce um, Professor Philip Morgan from the University of Newcastle in Australia and highly recommended from last year for both benefits in society category and student engagement category. Thank you very much. Uh, and just checking, can you guys see that? Um, some yep. slides to share, can you guess? Yep, that's all good. Or is that better? Is that the slide with the notes or the? 
That's one with the notes. It was okay. better before. So it's a bit, bit, bit backwards down under, hey? <laughs> Perfect. That the one? Good. Great. Thank you so much for having me on tonight. It is a pleasure, even though here we are in Australia at uh, 12.30 at night, but, it, but I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to um, provide just a brief overview of what we've been doing with the Daughters and Dads program, um, but importantly, to signify um, what a great thrill and how beneficial it was to receive such a prestigious award. So I'd like to acknowledge all the team uh, in Newcastle that have worked on this and all our funding partners as well. But importantly, we're often asked, why daughters and why dads? And so as a physical activity and nutrition researcher, working a lot with families, it was identified really early that um, most fathers are just not enrolling in parenting programs. There's a whole range of reasons for that. Similarly, our girls face a whole range of issues in terms of their physical activity levels, their social and emotional well-being. So initially, from a scientific and research perspective, or we interested, what would happen if we brought fathers and father figures into their daughters' lives using physical activity and sport as the engagement mechanism? And this had never, there'd never been a program evaluated um, internationally that explored the father-daughter dyad. So the last uh, 10 or so years has just been a wild ride and quite a juggernaut from answering a scientific question uh, and then seeing the impact through multiple randomised control trials where we saw improvements in the father's uh, physical and mental health, um, the girls' physical activity levels, huge improvements in their self-esteem and social and emotional well-being, perhaps most importantly, a strengthening of the father-daughter bond. But we used um, a whole range of um, education, quality education for all, where the daughters and dads learned together about the importance of gender equity, where we needed males as gender equity advocates, but we need to empower our girls to be critical thinkers, to be resilient and persistent um, and understand that their opportunities in life are not defined by their biological sex. And so the results were quite profound. And from those uh, initial studies, it's been a really interesting journey where it probably was a bit more build it and they will come. We've, when we've presented the findings from this, it just sparked so much interest. For example, from our state government here in New South Wales, Australia, who have invested $2.4 million when they saw the impact it had for empowering girls through sport and physical activity to roll out across the state. Um, a nine-week face-to-face program, but also a weekend diversion. And then when they have been presented, we have been inundated with um, interest from the sports sector who uh, want to develop a sports-specific um, variant of the Daughters and Dads program. So already um, we have a Daughters and Dads cricket program in partnership with Cricket Australia and Cricket New South Wales and Western Australian Cricket and other associations. Um, with the World Cup for basketball being in Australia this year, we'll be, we've developed and piloted Daughters and Dads basketball, and that will be rolled out this year in, in New South Wales and then for Australia. And then also planned with the World Cup for football um, being in Australia next year. Football's the next sport in line. So it's just been fascinating to see the number of sports who, are, who have so many great initiatives targeting female participation, but the innovation, the magic of this program is something that, that is seen as a game changer. And so that's just been a fascinating journey. Um, we also, again, have been in the UK in partnership with Women in Sport, uh, funded through Sport England, where English football clubs have been delivering the Daughters and Dads Active and Empowered program, not a football specific version, but a general program as they address girls' physical activity and empower girls through sport and positive father involvement and tackling gender equity. Um, next week as well, I begin facilitator training via Zoom, um, unfortunately, perhaps it would have been nice to travel for Daughters and Dads in Austria. And again, we've piloted um, Daughters and Dads in Cape Town in South Africa as a strategy to reduce domestic violence. And so this program has such holistic benefits. And so the journey and the interest that it has generated has just been fascinating. Um, you know, the program targets capitalising on um, quality time together but learning about parenting and learning about the importance of physical activity and fitness together um, and developing the girls' physical skills and confidence 
um, and also the father's parenting. And so again, given the impact uh, of the program that we're able to, uh, another arm of this is the actual training of the program, our Dean and Pro Vice Chancellor, John Fischetti, when I think all teachers should hear the powerful messages of this program. If you're gonna be a teacher in charge of students, you need to understand the importance of gender equity, child development, evidence-based pedagogy, engaging parents, community engagement. Um, and so the training had then been developed in a university course at the University of Newcastle where hundreds of student teachers can elect to study um, and complete the training. And then they're out in the community uh, involved in the delivery of the program and that, and we've also, um, led by Emma Pollock, this is her PhD, looked at the impact of the university course on addressing gender equity and the profound snowball impact of every single teacher, the hundreds of teachers have gone through, then go on to teach hundreds of students and the changes in both policy and practice as a result of the learnings of that program um, have really led to just such a broad ranging impact uh, of the program. So it's, it's an overview of where we're at. And uh, in, in terms of encouraging others to apply, there's a plethora of benefits in the category of benefiting society. I certainly know at the University of Newcastle, but also feel uh, as a researcher and academic that you, uh, so many people work hard and you know, publications are important. It's important to generate that quality evidence and have it peer reviewed and, and you know, submitted to top quality journals. But how can you demonstrate you're making a difference in communities? To actually be recognised for benefiting society is um, easily um, the most prestigious award, but also the award that gave us such great satisfaction as well, that all that hard work um, that to be able to demonstrate you're making an impact with your work, that it's making a difference in the community is highly valued by global institutions and particularly at a university. And so um, it's awards such as this that help um, your team and your work and to generate the support um, from the powers that be at the university who um, are very happy and, 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 sh and share in the glory of this particular award. We work with lots of stakeholders and partners across the sports sector, government, non-government, a whole range of areas. And even though they have specific KPIs, for example, they may be looking at uh, increasing female participation in a particular sport, but for many, it's more than just participation. So as organisations and corporations really want to uh, be, you know, be seen, but also to be doing something that this has great community benefit and just to see the joy um, and the shared joy and they're part of something that has been recognised, particularly globally, for benefiting society that aligns with so many organisations, broader vision. For the university course as well, for the future student teachers, so many student teachers sign up to be a teacher because they want to make a difference. They get such great satisfaction out of teaching and impacting on children's lives. And so when they hear about this program and training, um, and we really feature this award as part of the promotion that this, this program was received a highly commended in a, um, the International Green Gowns for Benefiting Society. It's something they want to be a part of. So as a bit of a hook for the program and to maximise that particular impact, that's been really great. And that same motivation can also extend to the families who sign up for the program. Actually, um, many families, uh, you know, judge the, um, and make decisions on what, how they spend their time based on the credibility. And so with the reputation of these awards, the credibility um, that is generated, then that just helps the snowball effect of recruitment and bringing families into the program because there's no greater esteem that can be associated than, than this award. And I've kind of put there in one of the points there that, that we actually feature as part of the slides for the families, but also in all our presentations, we have as one of the slides the... Um, this award listed very proudly, but it, it, it helps in so many ways for people to know that, wow, we're part of something that has been recognised globally. We're part of something that has um, been recognised, but also when you consider some of, the, some of our goals, which relate to you know, that quality education for all, addressing gender equity and providing better opportunities for girls and, and also for women, but good health and wellbeing. And so the way that this program will be 
culturally adapted, will be adapted for sports, will be adapted for universities. It's just got even such an exciting future um, as well. Um, and so just some of the practical aspects as well, developing that video for promotion, which was part of the, the submission, what a fantastic resource that sits on our website as well and is used a lot. Um, uh, the second last point I'd like to make before I'm happy to answer any questions is the actual process of sitting down with your team and thinking through how you address the criteria of the application is, is that just actual process, whether you win, lose or otherwise, um, is, 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 is really beneficial because it really makes you think about, okay, that's the framing of the criteria was really aligned well with that's a great way for us to position and demonstrate the evidence for all these really important things we're actually doing. And so that forms a basis and helps in other ways that you present in both presentations and also um, written applications. So actually having an opportunity to list all those things, provide the evidence and it's an award application, but the criteria is very clear, but also really does highlight the really important things you should be doing. And finally, um, I would just say that for our team at the University of Newcastle and our partners, you, you work really hard and, and it is just really nice to get this sort of recognition. It's really rewarding and motivating for the team to continue to do the great work. So again, I'm, I'm really appreciative of the opportunity to, to share very briefly an overview of what we're doing and why to just encourage anyone to apply and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Wow, oh, thank you so much, Phil. And um, I think it's amazing to, to hear your stories about how it's been replicated in different countries around the world. And that's a really key aspiration of the awards is that there's uh, um, obviously there's the celebration of the specific projects, but also it's a dissemination of what universities are doing and how they can, other universities and other countries can replicate these exa great examples to, to their own institutions and their own countries. Thank you Absolutely. so much. You're welcome. And thank you once again for staying up so late for, to join us. <laughs> no, 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 no problem. Okay, um, so thank you for all of our presentations. Um, has anybody got any questions that they may have? If you just wanna, yep, Hillich. I would like to echo what you just said, uh, Fiona. It's uh, really beautiful to see um, and beyond what we saw in the applications, uh, how this translates in, in what we've been doing. And I think that both you've, you've underlined something very important for the, for the process leading to even um, submitting an application. It's this teamwork inside the institution and the opportunity to exchange, to think about what you wanna submit, how you wanna submit and, and what it actually does because it allows to then also uh, generate new ideas and inspire new activities that you can then undertake. Um, it's also, uh, we hope, nice that you can meet uh, Nigeria, Australia, and, and maybe others. Uh, that's something that, um, it, it, to me, it, it already even this presentation gives me new ideas where we could see how we can build better bridges even between projects and how to scale up from there and, and help um, <clears throat> this co-creation and scaling up of activities uh, throughout the impressive network that uh, that you've been able to build uh, Fiona along uh, along the lines and and, uh, and um, well along the way um, so I'm sure that uh, with what you said Richard before um, and, and thank you for your introductory words there as well who, which actually complemented mine I, I hope and think and AUF will be on board as well we hope that our members from around the world those 2000 some and reaching out to the 20,000 higher education institutions that we map and, and document in the World Higher Education Database. We hope that uh, the 2022 edition will see uh, many innovative new projects coming, uh, coming our way. We will have more work to do, <laughs> but we will do it with pleasure. <laughs> Because <laughs> it is quite something. We take it uh, not lightly. We really go through all these uh, applications with a lot of care, and and it's it's often very difficult also to to take a decision because many projects are beautiful. But uh, yeah, we value uh, 
the enormous energy that comes out of these paper or online documents. And uh, congratulations on that. Perfect. Thank you, Helena. And I, I, I think sort of what Phil was picking out there as well, and what you've just said, is that that, that time to reflect um, as part of the process of applying, I think that's really crucial. And then that in itself can sort of bring the team together and then motivate to carry on. Um, we've just had some questions that come up in, in the chat as well. Um, so um, can institutions apply with ongoing projects? Uh, the answer is yes, they don't have to be um, completed. And as Phil says, often uh, projects um, as well as the Covenant uh, University with the RCE, um, they are ongoing projects. What we do need is to have enough data to prove the impact that the project is having. Um, and the judges very much realize that many projects are long-term projects. Um, so it, it, the project does have to have started and started to have shown what the benefits are, what the impacts are, so, so there's enough um, evidence for that. Um, but as we can see, especially from Phil um, and from Covenant University, that the, the work it doesn't stop once you've applied, it does continue. And then that's a chance to disseminate and replicate as wonderfully shown by both of our speakers today. Um, one of the other questions was about the project. Does the project need to address the SDGs? The answer is yes. As part of the application process, we ask institutions to identify up to four SDGs that are relevant to their project or their initiative. Um, and we uh, provide all of that information within our website and our um, finalist brochure and winner's brochure. Um, so we can show, also show the impact that universities are having um, across the world um, for impacting the SDGs. Um, so that's very important for us as well. Um, I, I'll put this uh, next question back to our guests. Um, how do we get or how does an institution get the leadership support needed for entering the the Green Gap Awards. Yeah, I'm happy to, to answer from our perspective in relation to that. As I alluded to, I think many more universities um, are moving towards really wanting to support um, these sorts of award applications for many of the reasons that, I, that I'd outlined. Um, in our university, we have you know, an awards branch that helps to identify those awards that might be aligned with certain projects. So. For us, it was a little bit easier where there was a direct pathway and connection and leadership that was more than happy to support that. So I just think the nature of this award, I don't think that would be an issue. And if there's not that similar person, you know, there's a, a way that you can go to your pro vice chancellor, et cetera, or, or flag it with them via email and whatever signatures are required. I, I generally find that I would think they would be more than happy to, to support that. And, and Phil, we just wanted to have you before we go to Dr. Falasha Day. Um, does after winning the award, um, does does that then increase the recognition that your senior management team within the university has about the project and the initiative that you're running? Oh, absolutely, yeah, I, and I mean they've always you know been been very supportive and and you know very proud of the work that we're doing in this field with each of these, but this this one. Um, given its significance is something whereby it really does put you in on the map and then there's many ways and offers of support um, that they can provide to you from that um, you know and, and so th I think that's a, a huge thing and, and I'm sure that would be the case for many institutions in terms of winning these awards and that can manifest in in different ways in terms of levels of support um, that the university can provide for you or your pro vice chancellor so um, yeah, I think I think for anyone applying for those particular awards, and particularly uh, you know how competitive they can be, particularly globally, that that clearly is um, valued by leadership at university, and and does help to put you in the spotlight, really, which has many benefits for yourself and your team. Thanks so much, Phil. Um, Dr. Falashide, do you have any comments on that about, that about leadership uh, support? Thank you, Fiona. I 
the well, we have a major sponsor for RC, and our major sponsor right from inception has been um, one of the banks in our financial institution industry, and that's Zenith Bank. And um, they've been so supportive. Of course, we are still in talks with other sponsors, you know, to improve our, to, in order for us to be able to improve our scope and do more than what we are doing at the moment. And, um, you know, just to um, answer some other part of your question, um, like you asked Phil, um the moment the award came it was it it really brought you know rce in covenant university into the spotlight and why did i say that um immediately the award came it was announced it was it was a, it was made a thing you know and um, aside from that immediately from the university management we got another represent they wanted us to represent in a similar um, 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 assignment you know with the united nations so it's something that the university was delighted about and of course the sponsors too um, by the time we did the reports to them it really brought them you know much delight and they are ready to go ahead um, continuing with the sponsor thank you Thank you so much. It's great to hear, and it's always great to hear, um, you know, the, the after effects of, of what's, what happens to institutions once they've won. Um, that, that's so brilliant to hear. Um, if there are any other questions, um, if not, I would just raise that um, we do very much uh, try and profile, um, not just our winners and highly commended, but all of our finalists. Um, and we'll be running an event in conjunction with UNEP in July. And this will be an opportunity to, um, for pres presentations and dissemin further dissemination um, of the, of the um, applications from 2021 and, and, and previously. So again, we continue to share the stories, continue to share the good practice and to really sort of help that replicability um, across the um, the world in, in all of our universities and hopefully together we can all make a difference. Um, so thank you everyone for all of your help and support um, and uh, I would like to um, leave that there. Thank you so much and just a reminder that the deadline for applying for the International Green Down Awards is on the 31st of March and do go to our website for further information. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you, everyone. Good Thanks. night. Bye.